A new lawsuit says Facebook's auto-tagging feature is a violation of our privacy. An Oculus engineer is heading out on her own to make a wearable to cure disease and a new game that includes friendship and wrestling. All that and more on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1508, recorded Friday, May 6th, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. And by Trunk Club, get clothes that fit and look amazing without ever stepping into a store again. Trunk Club will help you create the wardrobe you've always dreamed of with your own personal stylist. Go to trunkclub.com slash TNT and join Trunk Club today. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100 plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. Oh, hi. This is Tech News Today. We like to talk about tech news. We technology. like to talk about tech news. And it's Friday, Friday. Sorry. <laughs> we do like to do that <laughs> with people who love technology. I'm Megan Maroney. And I'm Jason Howell. I promise not to sing anymore in this episode. <laughs> I can't make that promise for the future. Well, you know, in the pre-show, I said I don't like to dance, and then I just did. I just, so. yes. <laughs> we got you out of your comfort yes. zone. Ex Excellent. Yes. I love it. All right. All right. Uh, let's talk about some news items. We've got some really interesting stuff to talk about today. First up, not two days ago, we chatted with Ethan Scheel uh, from Fusion about the lack of rules and regulations around face recognition software in the U.S., and today... A lawsuit charging that Facebook's automated photo tagging system is an invasion of user privacy overcame Facebook's motion to dismiss. That means that the case will move forward, possibly becoming an important beacon in determining the rights U.S. citizens have when it comes to their faces. Mm. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> so so timely. We were just talking about this. Yeah. Uh, basically, this is all about kind of explicit consent. Uh, by users, and uh, specifically in Illinois, where the case is, is uh, being conducted, you know, were users, were Illinois users given the opportunity, you know, to say explicitly, yes, you can, you can track my face and use that for searching across the wide network of, uh, of Facebook. There's a disclosure in Facebook's data policy, and it specifies in there that users can opt out, but is that enough? That's kind of what's on on par here. Yeah, it's Illinois' Biometric Privacy Law Information Privacy Act. It's it is interesting because that's what we were talking about. Like we do. I mean, I think yes. Uh, if you it is opt in, um, you can opt out, but um, you know you'd have to dig through. Uh, the privacy policy in yeah. order to do that. I tried to do it. It took me too long. I got bored. I was like, yeah, they already got my face print. Who cares? And you need to know to do that. You yes. know, that that's the other big part of it. And it always can, you know, terms of service. Everything's in the terms of service. Right. You got to read through your terms of service. Meanwhile, the terms of service is like a volume of the encyclopedia. Uh, and so nobody reads it. I mean, some people do. They're obsessive about it and they want everybody to know that they do what everybody else doesn't. But the rest of us, we usually don't necessarily thumb through the terms of service or, you know, these long, lengthy documents to see this stuff. So then I guess, are we just asking for it then at that point? <laughs> I don't know. I, mean, I think there's some implicit trust in Facebook and Google sure. and Apple and all these companies. Uh, we just trust them. And it's economically uh, in their own interest not to make everybody really angry. So, mm, I mean, that's the thing. That's they, they have this information. They have our face print. They could use it for good or evil. And we are signing away a lot of that when we use Facebook. And that's something that you can, you don't have to use Facebook. So I don't, I mean, I, I want them to use it responsibly. And I think so far they are. Um, I can't imagine doing them. I can't imagine Facebook doing what this company was doing that we talked about earlier, creating a dating website right. that would let you say like, hey, I saw that lady on the bus. I'm going to find out everything about her with right. her picture that I took secretly. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, it's it's all, you know, the argument of the slippery slope. Yes. You know, and just being like, if it starts slope. here, who knows what will be normal two years from now that 
we would have definitely objected to now, but because we're so you know exposed over a long period of time, it ends up just kind of being the way it is. Now, um, the EU has actually banned uh, since I think 2012. Uh, the use of these auto tags uh, based on face. And Canada, same thing. They've banned tag suggestions as well. So, I mean, it's kind of, those are pretty, two pretty big markets mm -hmm. that long ago, actually, years ago, said, we don't like this, we don't, we're not allowing it. I think in the EU, there's tag suggestions now. They, they kind of put out an update to allow for it, but only, only using uh, American faces you know yeah. americans as, as their faces is like it's not tracking anyone in the eu so right. so it's like a limited use of it yeah but still protecting their citizens from it right i mean i think i've sort of come out sounding like i don't believe in privacy and i do and i think um you know the eff and the aclu have tried to work with facebook um they they uh like they actually gave up on negotiations with facebook last year mm -hmm. they were talking right. to them and like facebook wouldn't give at all, you know, and they just got frustrated. So, it, I mean, I, I do I do depend on places like the EFF and the ACLU that they are looking out for me and they're going to let us know if uh, if this goes too far. But, yeah, right now, I mean, it seems like uh, they, you know, this, it's going forward. This, mm -hmm. this lawsuit's going forward and we'll see what happens next. Yep. So if you want to devote your life to curing disease, the Oculus division of Facebook is apparently not the place to do it. At least that's the lesson I've chosen to take from the news that Facebook's executive director of engineering and the head of display technologies at Oculus is leaving the company to work on curing disease. Uh, Mary, uh, Mary Lou Jepson, uh, she is a pioneer in display technology. She worked at Oculus, Google, Philips, Intel, MIT. She was the CTO and co-founder of the nonprofit One Laptop her child, she uh, is leaving the company. She told a packed house at the Anita Borg Women of Vision Awards that she plans to work on new imaging technology that will attempt to cure diseases by shrinking MRI machines into a wearable. It's much more complicated than that, but uh, that's basically the idea. Uh, and it's fascinating, and she is really the woman to do it. Uh, she, I mean, she has such a, a history in uh, this field, and it's fascinating that she's doing this. Um, so she, uh, she's also joined an automotive company, she says. Um, she had brain surgery herself, mm -hmm. so she's fascinated with the brain. She has this great TED Talk. I highly recommend anyone watching it if they're interested. She says that uh, this technology could help treat cancer, cardiovascular disease, uh, mental disorders, neurodegenerative disease. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. So you did a little more research, too, on, well, on this. Yeah, I mean, there was um, right before the show, probably about 20 minutes before the show, there was an article posted on xconomy.com, which I guess the guy that writes that article normally checks in with her on other topics on today, you know, but of course he wakes up this morning and realizes all this news is hitting. So he's like, so let's talk about it. And so she went into a little bit more detail. Of course, she's being cagey on certain things because after all, this is her life's work. Like this is something that she's been wanting to do. It was, it was something that she wanted to lead at Google while she was there, but Google had different um, different priorities that kind of push her in different directions. But I mean, her life's work is all dedicated on high resolution imaging and that combined with, you know, what you were saying, you know, her own history with kind of uh, brain disease, essentially. She, she wants to really kind of take this high resolution imaging into the world of MRI to create the next generation of MRI, shrinking it down, like you say, into a wearable. So thank Google Glass with MRI capability so that all doctors can wear it and have you know, have immediate access to this ability. I, I, I don't know. I don't even pretend to understand how this would be possible because MRIs, you know, require such huge, right? Uh, you know, mecha well, she's, <laughs> mechanical she, things. To, she said to it pull would off, be but. like the size of a ski hat. That's like we're not talking about an Apple Watch or something, but it's a room-sized right. technology shrunk down to. A hat. Which is pretty impressive, <laughs> you know, when you're thinking about kind of what we have now and what she's looking to do. She thinks she can make this happen in a few years' time. Uh, she says she's been trying to to move towards this since tw uh, 2005. I also found a um, a talk that she did at Google for We Solve for X that was just really fascinating. It kind of blew my mind, quite literally, um, <laughs> where she kind of showed how uh, how researchers were able to take scans of the brain and analyze what they see from brain activity based on what someone is looking at versus what they remember looking at. Mm -hmm. And those scans were very similar. And what they can then do from that is, for instance, they could take the MRI scan from somebody and run it through kind of these patterns and these models that they've already, you know, kind of devised uh, with their technology 
and they can recreate the image that that person saw at the moment that that MRI was taken. And there's actually video. If you play the video, uh, Kara, it'll show kind of a little bit of that kind of side by side. But uh, really interesting stuff. And I think that's at the core of this. I think that's really what fascinates her. If you can see on the left is the presented clip and on the right, that's actually recreated from the MRI scan. And so what she wants to do is she wants to take this and make it higher res, essentially boost the resolution on what they can capture from the brain. And just think of the, like the long term, like there's obviously the saving lives and all that kind of stuff, but you're talking, it also gets into a very gray area of like this future where they can, where you could be a criminal based on the things that you're thinking because they can actually capture what is in your what is in your mind what you are thinking what your mind's eye is seeing and reconstruct it and that could criminalize yeah it's interesting I and mean, some it's of the fascinating yeah some of the headlines were like she wants to develop a wearable that can control your thoughts you know yeah. <laughs> and it's uh it is interesting i i was chastised i'm not sure if this email was sent to both of us or just me but um for using the word creepy about uh. technology so uh I'll instead use um, disconcerting. <laughs> or, Don't use the word interesting. I've already no. been called out for that word no. many times. No, and I get so. it. Yeah, like when you talk about face prints or something, it's, yeah, I mean, it's it's a little Luddite-ish um, to, call, to call things creepy. But, uh, yeah, so science is fascinating. Well, and what we were talking about yesterday as far as, like, the, the uh, you know, uh, the slippery slope just... I don't know, like, or, or just the fact that if a tool exists, it would be used, you know, mm -hmm. and if it doesn't exist, of course, we can't reconstruct the brain to, to find out what somebody's thinking right now. But in the future, I mean, apparently, uh, they will be able to do a pretty darn good job of it. And what does that mean for, you know, the, uh, the future 20, 30, 40, 40 years down the line? Mm -hmm. I guess we'll find out. Mm -hmm. Warner Music Group, one of the three major labels in the U.S., is reporting in its earnings that revenue from streaming... Music rose $72 million for the quarter. This makes streaming its biggest revenue source for the first time. Streaming revenue from services like Spotify and Apple Music, just to name a few, beat out Universal's revenue collected from its digital downloads and physical sales. It was a year ago that they announced that their streaming revenue surpassed their digital downloads. And this is the first time that it's, it's right up at the top. You know, last year, physical sales still were reign supreme for them. And uh, not so much anymore. Uh, changing of the guard as far as that's concerned. It doesn't really surprise me. I mean, for the price of a year subscription on Apple Music or Spotify, I could buy 12 albums. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I mean, you're into music. I am only vaguely into music. Even in my youth, I don't think I ever bought 12 albums in one year. Yeah, mm, I did. Yeah, I bought a lot of albums <laughs> you're in not my a youth. Good example. <laughs> I was a collector. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean that. So like, it's a as, lost as, art as adult, now. like maybe as a kid, you did, you do. But like, I don't think many adults are, you know. No, it's I don't true. Think the majority of adults, the majority of people who subscribe to Spotify and Apple Music would not otherwise have bought twelve or more albums per year, which is the same price. So Very true. Sense. Um, so I guess good for Warner, although they're still kind of complaining, you know, that they aren't making more money, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, CEO Stephen Cooper called for fairer, a fairer correlation between paid subscription royalties and places where free music can be found, you know, things like on YouTube where music is there, but it's unlicensed and it gets past the filters or whatever, and they don't make any money off of it. Uh, you know, they, uh, the music industry and particularly the big labels are really fighting up against that and saying, hey, this is really unfair. We should be getting paid for all this. And then, of course, there's the artists and, you know, how much of that actually hits the artists. Artists are always complaining about how little they actually make from streaming music. So if, if a Warner is making you know, is, is making most of its or the majority of its revenue based on its other revenue sources on streaming and its artists, you know, are they complaining about streaming revenue? If so, then there's an imbalance that probably needs right. to be tackled. Yeah. I mean, that was what I needed a little primer on. I was like, do you, do they get, does Warner get paid by Spotify and Apple music every time like I stream this particular song or is it like a, you know, a flat fee? And yeah, so I mean, that that's why streaming doesn't make any sense. Like it doesn't, you know, it's like the more people that are using Spotify and Apple Music, the more money that Apple Music and Spotify are paying, right? Uh, yeah, that's why music, music online is such a, a difficult business. Uh, these companies are having a really hard, like, it makes sense. It feels like the future. It makes sense that this would be the way that we want to get our music now. And by and large, that's what this kind of proves out mm -hmm. is that this is how people uh, are preferring to get their music nowadays. But there's something weird and, and out of whack with the, with the economics around it. Yeah. Um, 
some, you know, you would think that the services would be doing amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think by and large, it's a really hard business to get into. Yeah, there was just a Wall Street art Journal article that just got posted because I was thinking about this. I like to listen to comedy. Like, that's what I listen to a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's still amazing to me that I can go on Apple Music and just listen to an entire comedy album. I would never have bought a comedy album. Never. Because I would listen to it once and right. then not, you know, so it's just all there. It seems like the, uh, you know, the economics of that don't seem to make sense exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I think that's why, like, I couldn't necessarily listen to like a Louis CK album like I don't think he has sold the rights but like the smaller comedians and I guess that's where it comes back down to like you discover new music that sure, way discover, that you might yeah. then buy yeah so. you might well you might end up you know buying other things that are related to the art I might end up going to see yeah, them right that's, that's another side of the, ar <laughs> yeah. of the argument as right. well the artists make it through the live and the merchandise and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. but well, Snapchat is in hot water again because of its filters and not the taco filter from yesterday, which I enjoyed, even though it was bothered. Oh, I missed that one. I, well, uh, uh, you did miss the tweet of of Padre's face as a taco. I'll send it to you directly because okay. I don't I, want you I to miss that. I did miss that. that <laughs> BuzzFeed <laughs> says Snapchat plagiarized one of its lenses from a Russian artist named Alexander Kolkloff uh, and did not give him any credit. Snapchat told BuzzFeed, we agree that this lens is similar to other artists' creations and we have removed it. So I found this fascinating because, uh, I mean, if you scroll down, you can see, uh, if you're watching the video, you can, that, there's the artist. There he we, is. We'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. keep going, though, because it's, it's this so art, that's, right? But that, the style of art, That's anyways. his style. But So that was this his, the, that's his yeah. picture. Uh, and, you know, it looks a little bit like David Bowie makeup or, you know, <laughs> it's like something Picasso-ish. But then if you scroll down and see the um, the actual filter, like it's so similar. I wish I we could see them next to each I think, other. I think that there might be a side-by-side -side if you keep scrolling down. And actually there are, there are details um, when you do look at them side-by-side -side where you realize like the yellow uh, kind of V-looking thing is in the same spot, the green underneath the yellow is. So that, that what we're looking at now is someone else claiming that it was their art, oh, which then yeah, everyone which said, well, you I actually don't... plagiarized yeah. that from someone else. But yeah, the colors are so similar. Um, I think it's fascinating. It's, I think, plagiarism and creativity in the age of the internet is a fascinating topic because it's so easy to prove that something is plagiarized. But at the same time, um, you know, we do have similar ideas at the same time. Like, I don't know if you've read the book guns, germs, and steel. It talks about like the discovery of alcohol and throughout history and like ideas do happen at the same time. Mm -hmm. But this, uh, this seems to be just copied. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I wish I wish I had put in the link of the actual side by side from the filter because uh, I did see it this morning when I failed to put it in the doc. But when I looked at it side by side, I was like, you are lying if you are saying that this is not directly pulled from it. Right. Like that is an actual flat out lie because there are too many similarities yeah. down to the color and the shape and all that and the placement right. and all that kind of stuff. There were a few things out of whack, but most of it was there very, yeah, there we go. That's a very good example of it, right? You've got the green and the yellow on the, on the left, uh, left side of the screen on both images following the same, same kind of shape pattern. Uh, the eye, the white right under the eye. There's just, you know, in the yellow and the eyeliner. It's just like so much of it is is similar, uh, but different enough, I suppose, uh, that I don't know. I don't buy it. I think it's a, I think it's a ripoff. Yeah, I mean, there's another artist, Wedha. I don't know, he's a pop artist. We have a link to that too. It's similar, uh, but yeah, similar I, art. Um, yeah, maybe it's just a an interesting art style that is very easy to have similarities in. Right, I, but I this don't know. Is too close. It's yeah, pretty see, close. That, that's another, yeah, see, this is Wedha. I guess uh, pop icon portrait so they're they're all very similar i'm wondering if maybe we need to come up with a snapchat filter snafu watch segment yes uh, i'll like, be in charge da, 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 of the research you know every week we'll have what what did snapchat do with their filters <laughs> right, this week that, exactly. that has everybody upset yeah they said it's an embarrassing mistake they they said it's embarrassing no, they've had a few of those the past couple of weeks yeah. it's happening. we'll just call it snapchat's embarrassing mistake yes segment. all right <laughs> <laughs> with loud, splashy graphics and, and sound effects. Uh, and now SpaceX proves just how bad eh, they are yet again by landing uh, another Falcon 9 rocket on a drone ship at sea for the second time in under a month. In response, SpaceX uh, founder and CEO Elon Musk took to Twitter to say, woohoo! <laughs> this may be the second time SpaceX has successfully landed its rocket on the drone ship, but it actually wasn't expecting to pull it off this time uh, due to uh, achieving more kind of like an extreme velocity uh, and reentry heating in order to reach the more distant 
geostationary transfer orbit. So they were able to pull it off even when they didn't think they were going to, which is even more impressive. Yeah, they're getting very good at that. They said I that know. they have so many reusable rockets, they don't have space for them in the hangar. What hangers. are we going to do with all these rockets? <laughs> That's Braggers. what Elon Musk said, and he might have been joking. Uh, and, you know, there was a related story that I just found that uh, apparently Elon Musk's Teslas can also land, too. Uh, there was a story in Electric today about a Model S that flew 82 feet in the air Ugh. and then crashed. This is not a picture of the Model S, but we do have a link to that. Uh, so a, a girl took yeah. out her dad's Tesla, 18-year-old girl with four of her friends. They got in a horrible crash. They all walked away with non-life-threatening injuries. But it, it came, landed from, it was 82 feet in the air, and they just walked away. Like, there's a picture of it. I said the crumple I don't know. Zone. I don't know how you get anything like a, like a car 82 feet in the air. That's, that's that's incredible. But I did see there's like a little ramp that they were going full speed. They hit this ramp yeah. and and launched in the air. What I do think is interesting about this though, and from what I was reading, is that because the Tesla doesn't have the traditional engine up front, what you end up with is a very large crumple zone. Mm -hmm. So that on impact, instead of a lot of that impact ending up in inside the cab of the car it's all kind of absorbed in the front. So that looked nasty, no mm -hmm. doubt about it. That right. was a nasty wreck. And the front of that car is like, it practically doesn't exist anymore. But because it was the way that it was without an engine taking up all that extra space in there, that gave it enough cushion to allow those four people to walk away from the wreck. It also uh -huh. didn't blow up as, as <laughs> yeah. gasoline Well, this isn't a Hollywood do. movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that, that's yeah. why, like, yeah, regular gas engines are dangerous, Yeah, right? no, that's true. That's true. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. Don't don't uh, drive like that. Yeah, yeah. Let, leave it to SpaceX, not Tesla, to fly and crash or <laughs> that's not true. crash. Don't try to land your Tesla like a rocket. At least they didn't land it on a drone ship out in the middle of the water. Mm -hmm. Up next, a look at a few of the week's biggest gaming stories with Sam Moscovich from Ars Technica, as we like to do on Fridays. But first, let's take a minute to thank Blue Apron. Get a little hungry right now. I'm going to make you hungry because you need to know how to cook. You know that you do. Don't, don't lie to me. I know that you know. Uh, not only will you feel like you know your way around the kitchen, but cooking at home means eating healthier and saving money instead of ordering expensive takeout again and again. Um, knowing where to start is always the challenge. Blue Apron has you covered. For less than $10 a meal, Blue Apron delivers all the fresh ingredients that you'll need to create home-cooked meals. You just follow the easy step-by-step -step instructions, and uh, every meal can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. Uh, the meals that I prepared through Blue Apron were absolutely that. They were probably right around 35, 40 minutes tops, and uh, it was just a, a great experience. No overwhelming trips to the grocery store, no more sad takeout, and you do it all yourself. So there's that like sense of satisfaction in the end. No matter your dietary preferences, Blue Apron makes it a breeze to discover and prepare dishes like Middle Eastern chicken and chickpea stew with chermoula and pita croutons, or spring asparagus and ricotta calzones with Arab Arabiata. They always do this with the with the foods Arabiata. that I can hardly pronounce, but I know that I would love them if I ate them. Ar Arabiata. Arabiata. Okay, that Spicy? works. Dipping Maybe. sauce and butter lettuce salad, right in your own kitchen. Megan approved. <laughs> Cook with ingredients that you've never used before, such as watermelon radishes, yuzu juice, and labna cheese. Recipes are between 500 to 700 calories per portion. It's delicious. It's good for you. And now you know why you need to check it out for yourself. Right now, you can get your first two meals free. Just go to blueapron.com slash twit. Check out this week's menu and get your first two meals for free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Today. All right, it is that time where we check in with Sam Moscovich from Ars Technica. How's it going, Sam? Hello, hello. Happy Friday to everybody. It's going very well up here in sunny Seattle. It's hey, something, something looks a little different, Sam. Did you get a haircut? Oh, you were there last week. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I no, it. I wasn't. <laughs> You're right. Okay. Yeah, I, got, I got new glasses. What do you think about Oh, okay, cool. I like your invisible glasses. They look really good on you. Uh, okay, so first of all, uh, we have a new trailer for the anticipated follow-up to Battlefield 4. Tell us what uh, Electronic Arts showed off this afternoon. You mean uh, Battlefield 1. Wait a minute. That's right. <laughs> it yes, you would think the new game would, would have a bigger number, but as Microsoft has proven, or actually as a lot of companies recently have proven, uh, the number just doesn't matter. They're just going to throw out whatever number they want. In this case, though, Battlefield 1 is named because we're looking at an alternate reality version of World War I. Uh, EA has been teasing a new Battlefield for some time. Uh, in fact... 
there was a Call of Duty game that was uh, announced earlier this week for, uh, I think, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, which is sort of a futuristic take. And some of the Battlefield developers went on Twitter and started mocking it, only then to delete their offending tweets, uh, mostly to hint at this which came up. Uh, the reveal looks beautiful. Uh, the catch being that it says, in-engine footage. Mm. So that it showed that in just tiny text just for a split second there, and you see this uh, crazy footage of this sort of throwback uh, earlier 1900s uh, machinery, this kind of really cool bi biplane sequence. Everything looks beautiful, and it's all uh, advertised as running uh, as an Xbox One target. The idea is that this is what an Xbox One game might look like. But there is a lot of really cool lighting and smoke and motion blur effect work that I have never seen on an Xbox One game. So however EA and DICE plan to pull this off is beyond me. But the release date of October 21st has been confirmed. Uh, this is going to be uh, putting you in the shoes of yet another bunch of dudes shooting guns. Uh, I do appreciate the fact that the current cover art includes something other than a white man being looked at from above. Now they have a black man being looked at from the side holding a gun. So we're moving somewhere in terms of inclusion on game box art. So uh, at, it's such a tiny little uh, sliver of a reveal. We don't know too much yet, but if they can make it look three-fourths as good as that, then it should be pretty good looking at any rate. Excellent. So moving on to uh, something that's kind of close to my heart, at least my history of, of video games is very tied to the game cartridge format. You wrote yesterday about Nintendo's upcoming NX console and how Nintendo might actually return to that game cartridge format. What are the tea leaves telling you out there? What are they saying? The tea leaves are relatively vague because, as we've talked about uh, in recent shows, Nintendo has been teasing little bits about their new system. Uh, it doesn't even have a name yet. We're still calling it Nintendo NX, uh, which goes to show how much we know. But what we're gathering is based on an announcement from a company called Macronix. Macronix is, uh, has been in the video game console business for a long time, as it turns out, and they've been supplying a lot of the ROM chips, a lot of these very specific memory chips that serve all kinds of purposes on everything from the N64 all the way to the PlayStation 4. Essentially, they have been making game stuff for a while. Uh, in particular, they've been providing uh, memory for the little cartridges that go in the 3DS system. And so what we are getting now is uh, we're, uh, uh, the guess based on their financial statements Macronix had made uh, is that Macronix is, ex is estimating a very high percentage jump in revenue right around the time of Nintendo NX's release. Uh, it's to the order of magnitude that those sales numbers would have to be attached not to hardware, not to specific game systems, but rather to the software because of the adopt rate. Essentially, there's usually an average of at least two games per every system sold for a new system. So based on that sort of information, we're starting to believe that this will be the first home game system in a long time that's going to go for physical media as opposed to discs. Uh, and so I took some time to write out exactly why that's actually a really interesting forward-thinking idea. Now, you may recall Nintendo was the last of the old dinosaurs to hold on to cartridges as something for the home system. In fact, this is the beginning of how they started getting their pants whooped during the PlayStation and even Saturn era. Their mm -hmm. cartridges were too expensive and they couldn't hold enough space and everybody was really interested in things like Metal Gear Solid and Final Fantasy VII, these kinds of games that had um, spoken audio and full motion video and all this stuff. Now you fast forward to today, think about any game system that requires a disc, which is typically a Blu-ray. Uh, when you put it in, you might think, oh, well, I need the disc to play the game. Turns out what it's only doing is it's dumping all of that data onto a hard drive because we've reached an era now to where all the stuff we're putting into our 3D games is, is so in, so much data for the textures and for all the stuff needed to run in the game. Uh, no Blu-ray drive that's affordable is fast enough to pump that data out at the speed you want to build like a giant 3D world. So these disks are essentially just dumping data onto a hard drive and then they become this little DRM check. So effectively, disks are useless now. And if Nintendo is really smart, uh, they will actually go ahead with this because they're talking about how this is going to be their first home su system in a while that they look to sell not at a loss. They want to make a profit on each of these Nintendo NX consoles that they sell. Uh, 
getting rid of a bulky disk drive and even getting rid of required hard drive to have a lower like minimum spec as the Xbox arcade editions had done in the past would be a very easy way for Nintendo to drop 40 to 60 bucks per unit built um, and just turn those, take a cartridge and add some rewritable data to it, which is something that hasn't been done really. But if you could imagine a 32 gig little cartridge, those do not cost that much more to make right now, especially in a bulk order sort of capacity than a piece of plastic for an optical disk drive. So it, the, the data is all pointing to it possibly happening, but all of the analysis makes it sound like an actually really good idea. So I, for one, look forward to a cartridge world return. I don't know that they're necessarily going to go with something where you have to blow into the... That was my, that was, that okay. I was wondering, yeah. I, because I, I don't know if I'm ready for a cartridge world unless I have to do that. So I, I, I think if you really need that, you could find a way. But, uh, you know, Nintendo's <laughs> been Nintendo's been doing discs, or I'm sorry, cartridges with its portable systems for a while. Yeah. And the rumors are kind of pointing to this new home system being something that goes home and away, something you can take with you that might have a screen. Nobody knows what the heck Nintendo's making, and they might just ship David Copperfield in like a tiny little box and he just makes magic appear in your house. <laughs> We're not totally sure, but it sounds like cartridges would give them more flexibility if they wanted to go the kind of portable, kind of home route. So, sure. waiting for it, but you know, I, I continue looking forward to all the retro cartridge styled uh, guesswork in the meantime because I do love an old giant cartridge. Excellent. And uh, a new game released this week that you say is your favorite four player game all year and after watching some gameplay I am super intrigued. I want to play this bad. Tell us a bit about what makes Push Me Pull You so great. I have a very soft spot for this game, and I'm very glad that when I emailed you about it that you said yes. Um, <laughs> Are you kidding? Push Me Pull You is, it, you, you just put, put it up on the screen right now because there's no point without explaining. This is a two-on-two -two video game sport that involves little worm creatures uh, each head is controlled by one joystick. So the idea being that each player is going to move one of these little bodies around to get this ball in the middle of the screen and move it to their side. Now, the, the, the game has these crazy sound effects. Every little foot foot or hand step has a little tuk 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 to it. And there's really great like trumpet music playing in the background. And as the little worm bodies stretch and grow and shrink, they make a balloon kind of sound. So it sounds like a, like a one of those stretchy balloons that people make balloon out of, animals out of. And the object is just to control these little balls and you have to work with the other person on your team to manage your little worm body. You've got to get the other duo out of the way while you push yours. And there's versions with different numbers of balls and different places to hold them. There's like a little timer that you can kind of see animating on the screen as it goes. Um, I was really fortunate to try an early version of this game out, and I ran a um, Games as Art exhibit in Seattle back in 2014, and this was the highlight. This drew giant crowds all the time. People would start being just intrigued by this quarter weird human centipede meets anime characters kind of thing, but they would stick around because there was a really legitimately cool sport kind of thing to it, something that you could only do in a video game that's very competitive and silly and cooperative, and there's a mix of strategy and laughing. Oh, it's just... If you need a game that you can play with up to three other people in your own home, all together in the same room, nothing will make you laugh or have a better time than Push Me Pull You. Uh, it does not work online, so you're going to need to get some friends in your house. But the good news is you don't need four controllers. They've actually worked it out to where two people on a team, can each person gets one of the joysticks, uh, which actually also adds this nice physical element of the people on the same team having to scrunch together <laughs> and use their joystick <laughs> and the buttons there in order to... There's a physicality to it. That's that brilliant. It's represented really well. Um, I love this. Game. Huge fan. I think it's $15. It's currently only on PlayStation 4. It'll be on every kind of computer, meaning Windows, Mac, and Linux later this year. Um, run, don't walk to get a copy of it. I love it. I love it. I love it. It's going to be in my top 10 for the end of the year. No doubt. No question. Love this game. Well, you know, Sam, I always love talking to you about games and you have incredible enthusiasm. But I mean, to be completely honest, most of the games don't really do it for me. But this one, I was super excited. And then I realized, like, I can't get it on Steam yet. I only have two games now on my Mac, uh, Minecraft and Kerbal Space Program, but that is going to be the third game that I get 
Uh, and then, really then you just have to get some friends yeah, to come exactly. over at the same time and play it all I mean, at the you, same time. Like, like getting four people this, in the room is no small feat for me. Well, no, I, I have that. five people in my family, so Oh, that's yeah. true. This hey, there you go. It's a good family game because it's kind yeah. of creepy, but it's not offensive. It's just silly and weird, like an old Ren and Stimpy cartoon. So yeah. that to me is just, oh, it's so good. <laughs> it is a little bit. <laughs> all right, finally, um, and no spoilers, but give us your 30-second take on your screening of Captain America Civil War, do we have another Batman versus Superman on our hands? We have the exact opposite of Batman v Superman. Everything that that movie got wrong, uh, Captain America Civil War gets right. I call it Avengers 2.5. It is the true successor to the original Avengers. Uh, the I want to say, I forget the director's names, I want to say the Mullen brothers, who really cut their teeth on the Community uh, series and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, they really balance dark and funny. Uh, there's a good amount of wit, there's a good amount of action, a good amount of mystery. Um, uh, Robert Downey Jr. is incredible. This really is the Empire Strikes Back of the Marvel Universe. It really sells sort of a downturn for all the superheroes, some existential anxiety about what it means to be a superhero, really continuing the ideas from the Civil War comic books in a way that you don't have to be a comic book geek to really appreciate and get into. Uh, you, you don't get necessarily the political subtext that the comics get into as much, but that's because there's so many characters, so much stuff happening that they still, f they found a way to focus this to be a watchable thing. Oh, and Spider-Man's great in it, too. Is that more than 30 seconds? I have a lot to say about this. I really... <laughs> I'm shocked at how much I liked this because I really like to poo-poo mainstream, bombast, blah, blah, blah. But this is the best Marvel movie I've seen in some time. Go see it. Hurry up and go see it. Oh, and see it in 3D. This is as good of a 3D movie as I've seen since Hugo. And I am not a guy who goes crazy about saying you need to put 3D goggles on. So Hugo, But if they're VR goggles, uh, that's another well, story. Let's... Don't... Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm about to start screening if I think of a, like an amazing Marvel movie in VR. Not yet. Now, <laughs> Someday. Captain America Civil War, go see it, get 3D glasses, have fun. Excellent. Uh, Sam Moskovich, always a pleasure getting you on. Uh, tell people where they can read this review and all the other awesome stuff you're doing. Uh, head over to arstechnica.com and uh, my stuff is all there. I'm going to go play a whole bunch of video games. There's Battleborn and Overwatch, all of these sort of like MOBA-style games in first person. It's a lot of people shooting each other in the face, and i got to figure out which one's the best. So tough work ahead I for know. me right now. It's, it's a tough go. job you have yeah. right there. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. All right, we got an email from Bill Burlingame from Huntsville, Alabama. He wrote in about our Tesla conversation last night. He says, Tesla is not the first company to include features not implemented in a product you own unless you pay an additional fee. One problem with that idea is that someone will eventually find a hack to circumvent the locked feature. In the 1960s, I worked for a company that manufactured computers. They were sold with either 4K words of core memory or 8K words of core memory. The problem was that all systems were shipped with 8K words. A jumper was used to either select or disable the second 4K word bank of core memory. Many users discovered how to use the jumper and thus bypass the extra cost for the additional 4K word bank of core. I'm curious to know how much that extra 4K cost. Yeah, that's a good question. And Let then, us know, Bill. Yeah, and, uh, you know, uh, scaled up to current you know, current cost, but right. uh, it, probably, it might be very similar, actually. Yeah. You know, it might mm -hmm. be somewhere in the two to $3,000 range, yeah. which is kind of crazy. Uh, maybe a little bit easier to hack then than, than it is now. But yeah, you, you when people know that there is, that it's capable of more, but that it's, you know, software is limiting it, I mean, that just makes it a target right there mm -hmm. immediately. Well, after the break, if your hipster coffee shop only takes square payments, you're going to want to stick around. I mean, you're going to want to stick around anyway. But first, let's take a minute to thank Trunk Club, the sponsor of this episode. There are two types of men out there, only two, guys who love shopping for clothes but are short on time, and those of you who hate it, either way, take heart. Now you can get clothes that fit perfectly and look amazing without ever stepping into a store again. Thanks to Trunk Club. And guess what? Trunk Club is now for the ladies, too. I have been working with my stylist, Carolyn, to find some new clothes for the show. She's been incredibly patient. Uh, she's helped me find some stylish stuff that fits in my budget. So whether you wear men's clothes or women's clothes, just type in your measurements, share your likes and dislikes, and your personal stylist will help you look and feel your best with clothes that fit you perfectly. Sure, your stylist is a professional trained in all the brands Trunk Club offers, but there's more to Trunk Club than that. They'll pick your clothes from over 80 top brands and ship them right to your door. Keep what you like, send back what you don't. Your stylist takes the time to understand your unique look. And if you live in Dallas, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, or D.C., you can stop by one of the Trunk Club clubhouses to work with your stylist in person. 
Trunk Club is not a subscription service. Shipping is always free and you have 10 days to try on the clothes. Make a statement at that next big event on your calendar with a look that's handpicked just for you and your style. Get started at Trunk Club today. Premium clothes, expert advice, no work, thanks to your very own personal stylist at Trunk Club. And Trunk Club is backed by Nordstrom, which means they have the highest standards and quality and customer service. Get started today at trunkclub.com slash TNT. That's trunkclub.com slash TNT, and we thank them for their support. So shares of the mobile company Square tumbled today. Uh, joining us to talk about why and why this matters is Ian Carr from Quartz. Welcome, Ian. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, Excited to be here. <laughs> thanks for coming on. Uh, so they had their worst day of trading ever. Uh, can you tell us a few reasons why? Yeah, I mean, shares are down 21%. They're trading, I think they close at 10, around $10 a share. Uh, yesterday's earnings, they were a little alarming for investors. Uh, um, the margins, the losses on the margins uh, for Square actually increased. And, you know, the, the company attributed it to a one-time uh, $50 million settlement fee that they were dealing with uh, over litigation uh, with, a, uh, with the actual uh, college professor. But still, I think it didn't really uh, resonate uh, a lot of confidence with um, everyone and uh, all the investors on Wall Street. And um, I think a lot of the problems uh, uh, also stem from the fact that the Square's lockup period is ending in, on, Mar on May 17th, which means that early investors like Kozla Ventures and uh, Sequoia Capital have the opportunity now to start selling off shares, uh, start selling off their stakes in, uh, in Square. And that you know, there haven't been that many liquidity events in the tech industry as a whole, and this is really the first one in a little in, a, in that investors that who have been investing in Square for you know five to seven years ha can now start you know getting some return on their on their investments. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. I think it's still TBD on whether these companies will actually sell off their uh, whether these firms will sell off their shares in in, in Square, but. I think that really hasn't uh, hasn't struck a great chord with Wall Street investors. So you mentioned the uh, the college professor who said that he actually developed uh, Square. Do we know anything more about that? Were they just kind of just settling because uh, they wanted to settle, or did did he have a claim? Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I think these are things that uh, early stage companies deal with, you know, pretty regularly. You don't really see newly publicly created companies deal with this. So it's kind of an unfortunate circumstance for Square. Uh, I, you know, it's really hard to tell about the the the, the individual's claim. Um, I think that they, you know, they settled the claim, so I think it's kind of uh, water under the bridge at this point. Um, but I mean, it's it's a weird problem, I think, because this is something that I think companies deal with in their in the early terms of their life, uh, not as a publicly, you know, traded uh, company. So, you know, we think of Square as the thing that lets us pay for anything, anywhere, uh, food carts and the like. But they, Square is also getting into loans uh, as well. Uh, how are they doing with, with those? You know, the, from what I hear, the lending division is pretty strong. I think that there are some alarming statistics about, uh, you know, how much it was getting. The capital, the capital markets are a little bit dry now, so it's getting a little bit harder to uh, find money to borrow. But So they had some uh, issues finding investors, but I think by the, uh, or rather, not finding investors, but, you know, kind of getting the deals closed. But uh, I think that uh, from what they said in the earnings call, that those uh, issues are now solved. And from what I hear, uh, you know, chatter in the industry is that Square's lending uh, division is pretty strong and that their margins are pretty, uh, pretty strong as well. So I think that, you know, analysts that I speak to are pretty bullish about uh, Square's, uh, Square Capital, their, their lending division. And they have a plethora of data that they get from these small businesses. Uh, so they know exactly what's going in and out of these companies and they know just the right amount of money to lend them to, you know, jumpstart and kind of, uh, you know, uh, help fuel the growth for these small businesses that they, that they cater to. So of course, Square is run uh, and was founded by Jack Dorsey, who um, is the, now the CEO of Twitter. Does that do, is that, is that doing favors to Square or is it hurt, hurting them at this point that they're, he's running both? It's hard to say. I think Jim Cramer from CNBC said that it's not doing doing them any favors. He thinks that uh, I think uh, Square and I think Twitter too are both co companies that deserve 24/7 attention. Uh, they're both companies in a really really interesting situation I individually, and it's really hard for an in someone, uh, even if uh, even if it is Mr. Dorsey, to find the time to fix all the problems at both companies. And uh, so 
you know, Jim Cramer at CNBC was saying that, uh, you know, Mr. Dorsey should kind of pick one company or something like that. And uh, so it's it's hard to say. Um, I think that investors aren't really I think that investors have always been a little bit worried about Square and the fact that, uh, you know, Jack uh, Dorsey has, you know, is running two companies. And I think that uh, that kind of concern is really coming to light now. And uh, uh, and especially with the lockup period, that's really, really uh, concerned a lot of investors. They're really worried about what's going to happen uh, on May 17th. Do you think uh, kind of along those lines, I mean, the longer that Dorsey is kind of in charge of Twitter and, you know, that, that public perception is really focused on him turning Twitter around. And is that happening? And right now, I think by and large, people are saying, you know, well, it's kind of dropping the ball as far as that's concerned. He has a lot of work ahead of him as Twitter and if Twitter continues to kind of go in the downward direction under his leadership, do you think that directly could um, could have a big effect on Square's kind of longer term uh, forecast? I don't really think it's fair to, I guess, kind of ties tie Twitter and Square's fates together. Mm -hmm. They're in separate, you know, they're in separate companies. They're separate companies, obviously, but more specifically, they're separate industries as well. Fin fintech and and uh, and. The, the financial technology industry has its own set of problems and Twitter and the social media industry has its own set of issues as well. I feel like uh, the, the fate of Square shouldn't really be tied to the fate of Twitter. And that uh, uh, that's just my opinion, I think. Right. It's, hard to, it's hard to tell. I feel like a lot of investors in Wall Street really tie the two together. And it's, it's kind of difficult to do that. I mean, yes, they're run by the same person, but the exec, for instance, the exec team at Square is really, really stellar. They're all ex Google employees, uh, they're, uh, or you know, come from very, very reputable companies. And uh, the exec team at Square is really, really strong. And the bench at Twitter is, you know, with Adam Bain and people like that, are is really strong as well. So these are companies that have great talent, and uh, and you know, just a matter of leveraging them, I think. And and I mean, the markets themselves, as a uh, as from a macro point of view, haven't been doing that well either. So yeah, I think that's, that's a that's really interesting to take into account as well. Well, Ian, you do an excellent excellent work covering financial technology. You also cover Bitcoin for Quartz. Uh, what's your whole take on on all the Bitcoin news this week? It's been a lot of there's been a lot of Bitcoin news. Uh, whether it's from the uh, you know there's a CoinDesk consensus conference and I attended and a lot of the chatter was about you know Satoshi uh, Nakamoto and whether this Craig Wright guy is is. Uh, is the creator of Bitcoin. It seems like some people are convinced. I, I spoke to Gavin and Andreessen, who uh, was one of the, is one of the core developers, who's na who told me he's 98% convinced. Uh, while another one, Jeff Garzik, said that he's not convinced yet. I think that the jury. I think that the consensus seems to be that uh, Craig Wright, since he hasn't moved the, the he hasn't used Satoshi's uh, private key to move uh, some of the early Bitcoins that were mined. It seems like the consensus is that. Uh, Craig Wright isn't Satoshi, but he's managed to convince a lot of really, really reputable people in the industry. Um, I think uh, it should be it's, it's worth noting that Bitcoin and the underlying technology behind it, blockchain, have both taken a life of its own, and it's not really important as to who created it. Um, you know, banks like J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs have, have been really, really in, interested in blockchain technology and have been experimenting with it as well. Bitcoin, you know, as an asset, uh, has been a great investment. Uh, I think there's an article recently that said that if you buy Bitcoin, it's actually you make more money than buying gold um, for the over the past couple of months. So they've all taken a life of its own. It's not really. I think it's just a, something that everyone is really naturally curious about in the industry. Uh, but wh whether we're going to answer to it is something I think still to be determined. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and, uh, Ian is at Quartz, so you can find him at QZ.com. And your Twitter is Ian Carr underscore, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. with a K. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on, Ian. Yeah, thank you for having me. Take care. Thank you, Ian. All right, TNT's fan of the day is Jean-Pierre Bontix at J Debunt on Twitter, who sent us this picture saying, yes, that is a standing desk for productivity. Productivity that is, of course, uh, until you put on our show and started watching it. And I don't know, does that make, maybe it makes you incredibly productive to watch TNT. I'm sure, actually, yes, that's the stance I'm going to take. <laughs> That's the better stance to take. You can mow lawns. You, you can, can mow lawns. You can do all your work. Code. You can focus on your work and listen to us talk about tech news in the background. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT 
You just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup, post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook, and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and we'll find it. Up next, Facebook on your watch, or on Megan's watch, because that's what you guys want, right? Right? But first, let's take a minute to thank ZipRecruiter, the sponsor of this episode. ZipRecruiter uh, is helpful for you if you're hiring, if you own a business and you need to find people, you, you, know, you don't know where to post your job to find the best candidates fast. That's what ZipRecruiter is all about. Posting jobs in one place isn't enough to find all the quality candidates out there. If you want to find the perfect hire, you're going to need to post your job on all those top job sites. And with ZipRecruiter, now you can. With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to more than 100 job boards, including social media networks like Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, all with a single click. You just post one time, and then you watch all the candidates. They just kind of roll in ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. Uh, you can search them by skill, location, work experience, and a whole lot more. ZipRecruiter's advanced matching technology delivers the most relevant candidates based on your specific criteria, what you're looking for exactly. ZipRecruiter offers optimized pages that look great on any screen. You can add their unique mobile apply process for more visitors and applicants. You can find candidates in any city, any industry, nationwide. Uh, you're not going to have to juggle emails or, you know, manage calls to your office. You can add multiple users to your account. ZipRecruiter just makes all this super easy for you. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by over 800,000 businesses and is trusted by hundreds of Fortune 500 companies. Whether you're hiring now or you plan to hire sometime in the near future, check out their blog for recruiting tips and hiring resources that could help you out and make, make things just that much easier. Now, right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. There you'll get access to millions of the resumes on ZipRecruiter with thousands of new ones added every single day. ZipRecruiter is the fastest way to hire great people. So if you're looking for great people, now you know where to go. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of Tech News Today. Have you ever wanted to check Facebook on your Apple Watch? Mm. Me neither. But mm. now you can with a little $3 app called Little Book. You can check your news feed. If your eyes are a lot better than mine, it's very tiny. Yeah. Uh, you can also post to Facebook just using your voice, like Dick Tracy would if he was on <laughs> Facebook and had an Apple Watch. Uh, so, yeah, it's one of these... Uh, things that is just like, well, I thought maybe I wanted that, but I don't. It's so small. Um, Patrick, uh, who is sitting right here, works on our show, and I follow him on Facebook, and I could see, like, he posted a receipt from going to see the Captain America movie, and I could see that. Uh, but very, I could see very little. You else. had to try really hard to see what was on Facebook on right. your watch. You can also like posts, which I thought, okay, well, maybe I'll just go Big through button. like liking everything, you know, yeah. just to make people feel good. But then you have no idea what you're liking, which is super dangerous because, I mean, he could have said something really offensive about Captain right. America and I didn't, you know, because I couldn't read what he said about it. <laughs> Captain Civil. Cap Captain, yeah, it says Captain Civil, because, you know, Civil War. <laughs> yeah. But, so, yeah, I mean, that's one of those things, one of these complaints about the Apple Watch. It's like none of the big apps are there, like Facebook. But what would you do? I mean, yeah, I think, I guess I could, if I needed to uh, update my status, I could do it in the shower. Uh, that's my goal for Apple Watch. What does it let so, me do while I'm showering? Yeah, right, yes, I remember this goal of yours. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I talk My about Moto it a lot. 360 <laughs> does not go in the shower. Uh, I think it would die if, if I tried to do that mm. with it. Um, nor do I really want it in the shower. <laughs> I'll go ahead and leave my watch out uh, and not get it wet. But I, I actually have played around with a handful of apps on the Android Wear platform where they do this sort of thing where it's like, well, you can, so here it is. Yeah. And it never ends up being like something that you're going to turn to all the time. There was one in particular that I looked at. I can't remember the name of it. I think it was called Docs for Wear. And it literally took Google Docs and all, you know, spreadsheets, docs, all that kind of stuff, and allowed you to view it on your watch. And I mean, just taking our single spreadsheet that we use for this show every single day, I mean, all you saw were tiny little lines and scribbles and you could, you know, it was very fumbly and very difficult. So yes, technically you can do it. Are you going to want to, is this going to be how you access Facebook every single day? I'm guessing probably not. No, I don't not. know. I think it's, it, finally we're, we're at the point I think where people are realizing 
that you don't want necessarily, I think a lot of people anyways, don't want the watch, don't need the watch to do all the same things that your phone does. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, that sounded great. Well, it's like my phone, but smaller, and it's on my wrist all the time, so things are easier to get to, whatever. But it just turns out like they, they have completely different strengths from each other. Mm -hmm. And sometimes your phone is just better at doing things than your little watches. So Exactly. So, yeah, I don't know. I think maybe save your $3. Um, save think, up for a push me, pull so. you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Apply it to your push me, pull you funds. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and I think it'd be a lot happier. Monday's guest will be Russ Pitts from Flying Saucer Media, uh, ex- uh, game uh, journalist as well there. It would be great to have Russ on. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 12 a.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be a part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv. You can leave us a short voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW and find us on Twitter. We're there at Tech News Today TV. We're always there. We're there. <laughs> Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TNT or whatever, wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. Thanks to our technical director, Kara Cole, and the team of people today who are helping us produce this show and every single day. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all on Monday. Have a great weekend, everybody. Ow. Ow.